Thank you very much for all coming out tonight. I know, or this afternoon, I know it's a beautiful day. Started out with some snow here, but uh, I think the groundhog was right. But I, I think we're, the beautiful Northwest, I think, shines through on a day like today. Anyway, I'm gonna, I have a lot to talk about. I'm going to try to, I tend to talk fast because I get very excited about what I have to talk about. So if there are questions, we'll have some time after, but uh, please remember what your questions are. I'd love to hear from you afterwards. So um, a little bit about our talk today. We're going to first talk about the history of nurse navigation, where it came from, uh, why it was developed, um, and some um ideas and suggestions for how it works, not only in the nursing role, but as a patient. Um, benefits of navigation, some outcomes, some examples. And then if you do not have a nurse navigator, how can you navigate this crazy system? As we talked about already, some barriers to care. We're gonna talk a little bit more about some other examples of barriers, and how as a patient do we get around those? And then we'll So just real quick, quickly, the history of navigation, um, back in the early 70s, the war on cancer, all this money started flowing in to develop treatments for cancer, uh, American Cancer Society has developed, all these organizations start to really draw attention to cancer um, treatments and all the modalities involved and making them better and stronger, more effective. And as a patient, you say yada, 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 because how do I get through those treatments? And how do I get that coordination of care? And that's when Dr. Harold Freeman, kind of the founder of nurse navigation, if you will, in the early 90s recognized his patients had a very high mortality rate. And through um, some investigative work, realized that a lot of them from diagnosis were not either aware of their diagnosis, didn't, didn't understand that they needed to go have a biopsy to find out what was going on, uh, just really kind of a disconnect, if you will. Um, it was, uh, if anybody's read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, yeah, that's, a, that's that population out there. Uh, Dr. Freeman is from Harlem, New York, and I think Dana Farber is where the Henrietta Lacks story came from. Uh, but anyway, so uh, a real mistrust of the medical community, so some, maybe a lady was called in for a mammogram and she didn't realize she had to go back, or maybe her address changed so she didn't get the letter saying you need to come back in, that sort of thing. So he instituted um, some people in his office to start calling people back and start reaching out, developing trust and, and better relationships with the community. So that continued on, got more and more attention. Uh, a lot of can uh, cancer centers started developing this program. There actually became a law um, and it created a lot of money to help cancer centers uh, um, develop navigation programs. I am not a billable service. I'm expensive to the cancer center. I can't bill for my time and my services. And if anybody, if I've worked with any of you, you know it's a lot of time involved. But I can help patients in a lot of different ways. So it's expensive for a cancer center to get navigators. Where I came from in California, we had 10 navigators in the cancer center. In Bellingham here now, we have myself. I do head and neck cancer. I do breast cancer. Uh, we have a lung cancer nurse navigator. and just hired a fourth, uh, well, fourth disease site. She does GI cancers. Um, and so we're extremely excited to have us on board here. We have one navigator down at UGH who's been really busy and a big asset down at United General. So anyway, the goals of the, the, the law and the amount of money that would be granted to various cancer centers in the country uh, was basically to help patients overcome barriers to care, to meet with patients, identify what, what do you need, what can we help provide for you, develop services, whatever it is to get you to care. Um, and then assist in the coordination of that care um, and then look at individuals who may be at risk for whatever it is that they may be at risk for and how can we help them in that. So more and more organizations saw this idea come about and said, well, we need to put it in a nice pretty little box. We need to define it, as we all do in um, various professions. And so there came kind of a two-role idea. One is an oncology nurse navigator and the other one is called a patient navigator. Both are incredibly effective. Um, a patient navigator is, it could be a lay person, it could be a social worker, it could be a nurse um, with or without cancer experience, just really help coordinate care, set up appointments and things like that. I identify more with the top one there, an oncology nurse navigator, um, as someone who has an experience in cancer care, you see the whole 
big picture that a cancer patient goes through. It's not just surgery. It's not just radiation. It's not just chemotherapy or immunotherapy or anything medical oncology does. It's a huge big picture uh, that you're looking at when you look at a patient. And I worked in a lot of different areas in cancer. And so when you have a background in that, I think it, it brings into a patient's experience a lot of different um, ideas on what may they, they may expect um, and what I can help set up for a patient. Anyway, the definition, they work with the Oncology Nursing Society and the Association for Oncology Nurse Navigators, all those different organizations were developed, and they came up with this idea of guiding patients to informed decision making. And I think that's a key part of it. And collaborating, the second key compl um, is collaborating with the multidisciplinary team. So I am not bound by the cancer center's walls. I go out and meet with surgeons that are primary in their own practice and private practice or I go to a dental office to meet with my head and neck cancer patients, or I meet in a tumor board setting with all the folks there and say, hey, but what about this? Or what do we need to do next so I can get it done in a timely fashion? <clears throat> so again, a little bit more again about what navigation is. You're uh, taking suspicious findings um, and you're seeking a resolution to those. Our lung cancer nurse navigator here in Bellingham, actually her, in, uh, her um, avenue into patients, I should say, is uh, she finds out all abnormal chest CTs and then she tracks them with the pulmonologist and to help with the biopsy team to figure out how to biopsy them. So it works with them even before a cancer diagnosis. And I'll show you some statistics on how effective that's been. Tons of support and education. Of course, with a cancer diagnosis comes a lot of emotional, psychosocial, um, and we'll talk more about that as well, but those factors that play into it. And, and so a lot of hand-holding, a lot of hours on the phone or meeting with people just to help in that um, realm as well. So seamlessly moving patients through the, the healthcare system and working within the organization to uh, eliminate barriers to care. I can, I can help one patient get over this hurdle and get from A to, to point A to point B, but if we keep running over that same hurdle, each patient I work with, not being as effective as I can if I work within the system to eliminate that barrier and it can effectively help a lot more people that way. I can tell you an example of that would be um, we're having some patients with a lot of dental issues um, and so in order to have head and neck cancer treatment it's imperative that they have an evaluation by a, a dentist um, and a lot of my patient population in the head and neck cancer realm either don't have health and ins uh, dental insurance um, or they haven't been to a dental a dentist in a long time. So how can I make sure these patients can get to a dentist? Um, cost is off, obviously, as we've talked about already, is a factor. And how can I get that done in a timely fashion? Um, in Bellingham here, Unity Care has a dental um, office. Um, that's a first come, first serve thing, unfortunately. So a cancer patient just can't walk in there um, and wait three months for an appointment. It's um, incredibly important that they are seen prior to treatment. And so we developed a, a really strong relationship with Unity Care, and I can get people in in very short order, and it has actually not affected my times from diagnosis to first treatment at all, and I can get people's actually all their dental care done um, prior to the start of treatment too. So some components, um, provision of information. Patients I work with here in Bellingham, I meet with them and I give them this whole binder of material and information. Um, I put in here their own radiology information. I put in their biopsy report, uh, my breast cancer patients. Um, I put this great, uh, I call it the Cliff Notes to Understanding Your Breast Cancer Pathology. Uh, if anybody's interested, breastcancer.org is a fantastic website. So if you're looking for good resources, um, and that's basically ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. So it's incredibly um, a valuable resource and well vetted um, and very, very well respected. So a bunch of information from the American Cancer Society in here as well. And I also put in our support services section our calendar of all of our events going on at the local cancer center here in Bellingham. We talked about non-clinical related treatment modalities or psychosocial help. Here in Bellingham, to our patients, we provide free yoga, Tai Chi, yo um, Qigong. Um, we have Reiki. We have a Reiki instructor that comes and teaches Reiki on patients. We have um, chaplain services. We have a um, nutrition class that meets monthly. We have an oncology certified dietitian. Um, we have hypnosis, massage. Um, it is incredibly important that all of that is 
is part of the process. We can turn a machine on or you can hang a drug, but that doesn't do much for the mind, body, and spirit all playing an integral role in the care. And so we also work very closely with one of the naturopaths in town here in Bellingham, um, who is a firm believer in integrative oncology. And we, have an, we had an executive medical director here in Bellingham was pushing for that. And before she left here, we kind of started creating that mindset more. And our nutritionist here in Bellingham actually is very focused on um, just oncology patients. So it's an invaluable resource. She was trained at Bastille. Uh, she worked with Andrew Weil for a long time, so she's got experience. <clears throat> Emotional support. Um, it'd be interesting to clock the hours that a navigator puts in on this, and I think any nurse does this, but it's a lot, a lot of emotional support and hand-holding. Facilitating decision-making. Um, before I came to Bellingham, um, I should say coming home, I grew up in Linden, um, I was a prostate cancer nurse navigator in California. And prostate cancer patients, if you've ever been involved in that care, you're given oftentimes three or four different treatment options, and then the doctors say, okay, what do you want to do? And a patient looks at you and says, how am I supposed to make that kind of decision? So I had spent a lot of time with a patient just talking through a couple of things and asking some key questions. And in doing that, the patient, um, it, it, I remember this conversation so clearly, and I said, you do, you do realize you've made a decision, right? I said, you, everything you've told me is leading to this, and they say, and then the aha moment comes. And uh, so it's really neat to see a patient come to their own decision just being able to talk through some things and also making sure, I, I try to make sure that they're very well informed um, in those, making those decisions. Creating linkages, as I mentioned, the unity care um, linkage, uh, a lot of that goes on in, wherever you're at. The big part of navigation, it's interesting, I go to different navigation conferences and stuff and it's hard because you, no, no navigation program is going to be the same from one place to another. It's going to be different because it's all about the needs of the community, the patients, as well as the clinical community. So what I did in California might not work up here, or vice versa. <clears throat> Provision of practical assistance. That, that can range from lots of different things. Anything that a patient can need, we can help facilitate. Um, and identifying and developing community support. So Unity Care is another great one. Uh, a lot of the other connections that we've made within the community here in Bellingham, the philanthropic um, connections that we've made, Tough Enough to Wear Pink, if anybody has seen that rodeo, that's a big um, support for the cancer center and for patients. A lot of what we've developed has come from financial uh, support. So some of the outcomes here at Peace Health, and I'm just sharing with you what we know just to, to show you what's done here. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a graph our lung cancer nurse navigator submitted in her yearly report to our cancer committee. Um, and we're looking at stage three lung cancer and the importance of stage three lung cancer is you can really affect whether or not um, this, you want to get those folks into treatment really fast. Um, because if it progresses on to stage four, we're looking at a different picture. So you can really make a big difference in the stage three lung cancer population. She was hired on around 2013 and really start identifying what are, some, what are some problem areas, what are some hiccups, what are some hangups to patients. And sure enough, by 2014, her relationships that she's developing within the, in the healthcare system at St. Jones and interventional radiology um, <clears throat> drastically reduced the, uh, the numbers of time from diagnosis to first treatment from over 40 to 27, and then the following year was at 18. That's fantastic. Because if you look at the national averages, and this is in the, the uh, Journal of Thoracic Oncology. Um, in public centers, in public hospitals and cancer centers, the median time frame was 76 days from diagnosis to first treatment. In private hospitals, it was 45 days. And she's down median to 26 and a half, almost 27 days. That's incredible. Um, this is my data that I submitted for the years I've been involved here. I know this is really busy and very difficult for anybody to understand. When I first started, we were averaging about um, from diagnosis to first treatment for head and neck cancers at about four to six weeks, which is honestly about the national average from the, the articles I've been able to find. Um, and we were down at one point. Oh, I'm just going to do a band of white. <laughs> um, in the 14 to 21 days. <clears throat> so down to about three to four weeks from four to six. So anytime you're able to improve the time frames from diagnosis to first treatment, you have better outcomes, much better patient outcomes. 
Also, as a patient, aren't you feeling better? I'm getting into treatment faster. So. And the other thing about head and neck cancers, if you're ever diagnosed with a head and neck cancer, you almost automatically inherit five new doctors. Um, and not only the appointments, but all the tests and scans, the uh, dental work I talked about, all that has to be done before treatment, and that's done in within three to four weeks. That's, that's insane. So I, I pulled up some stuff from the internet, and gosh, you cannot see that at all. Uh, but anyway, so I saw the VA. They were averaging about 44 days. University of Alabama was at 34 days. Um, and the uh, Oral Oncology Journal, prolonged initiation of treatment significantly impacts survival outcomes. So we can get people into treatment faster, they're gonna do better. So this is a difficult graph to read as well, but what it is is concentric circles with patient and family at the center. Uh, the core services are medical oncology, radiation oncology, and the specific people at the tumor, at the, the cancer center, tumor board and so forth. Then you have site-specific programs, uh, meaning like thoracic oncology of the breast, genital urinary, GI, dermatology, and so forth. The supporting departments on, on, outside of those are like pulmonary, the ENT surgeons, uh, urology, and then the community programs that surround that. And what my point is in that slide is to show you the navigator crosses all of those. The navigator is not just with the patient and family. They're not just in the cancer center. They're not just with the site-specific programs. It really is a, a, a person that can really cross over all those boundaries or barriers of a person a patient may experience. So an example of what this looks like uh, for a patient is, let's say they go to Mount Baker Imaging and have a mammogram, and then all of a sudden that prompts a biopsy, and then so tumor registry is informed of that patient, which then they turn around and inform me of. So a patient is then sent to a surgeon. They have a, maybe an aggressive tumor that needs ke uh, chemotherapy ahead of time, so the medical oncology appointment is scheduled. We go to a general surgeon, maybe put a port in, which is an IV access, for them, and then they need to go to radiation after their chemo, and then I need to get them connected with a bunch of uh, networks outside of the center to help with transportation or any of the other um, non-clinical related needs. So that's um, also a quality of life program, maybe our massage or yoga or something like that. That's kind of like a patient that would be represented on that graph there. <clears throat> so all of that is great if you have a navigator, but unfortunately there is, it's just, it's really hard to have a navigator for every disease site. So as a patient, how do I navigate uh, without a navigator? And if you've ever heard of Sun Tzu, anybody? The Art of War, a couple people. So he is a Chinese um, military war strategist, if you will, uh, from thousands of years ago. And his book, The Art of War, is still studied to this day on how to go into battle, how to pair troops, how all those kinds of things. And above and beyond anything, talking about the enemy, looking at the war, the battle, his statement was always, know thyself. So if you're going into battle against cancer, it's really important to know yourself. Know all sorts of things about yourself, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So a thousand battles, a thousand victories, when you know thyself. <clears throat> and what is the number one thing every cancer center, after every cancer patient uh, experiences. It's fear, right? When I was working to create a support group in California, I was, as I mentioned before, working with prostate cancer patients, and I was, I was talking with my husband and saying, what, I look at him and say, you're a guy, and he looks at me and says, yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, I said, what, what do I need to, to address? What are some things that, you know, I don't want to just do the clinical stuff. I really want to get to the, the meat of it. He said, peel away, the, peel away the layers of the onion and talk about fear. And so that's what we delved into and that's what we talked about. And I think when you do that and you figure out ways to tackle that, you're gonna be, your shoulders are gonna drop and you're gonna feel like this is doable. So the other important thing is to know your story. Um, and by that I mean start writing your story down. Right on today, or two days ago, I felt a lump. I called my primary care office. They told me to go in for this test. I went and had this test, then I had a post-test appointment with my primary care to find out that result. Then they encouraged me to go have a biopsy, so I went, well, what kind of biopsy did you have? 
when was it done? And did you have a post biopsy appointment? Did you follow up and receive the information about that pathology result? What do you understand that pathology result to be? Get a copy of that pathology report. If you don't get a binder and it's not already in there for you, ask it, ask for it. <clears throat> I'm a strong believer in those are your records. You want a copy of your history and physical that the doctor dictated? Ask for a copy of it. You should get it. Um, and, and you know your story. And you, when, you're be, when you're able to spit that back out to someone, I think it takes a lot of the power away from cancer. You're able to increase your knowledge about what's going on. This website, I think I won't go to it. I'm just going to talk about it and said, <clears throat> this is the National Cancer Network which is available to anyone. And there's different ways you can go about it as a, as a patient or as a provider. And this is basically, you remember your math from high school, the if then, if this, then that. And this is algorithms. This is basically what it is. It's a big database of algorithms. So you can find out if I have this, what's gonna be my next step in that journey? So it kind of decrease the fear again too because you're more aware of what's going on and what's coming. Find an advocate. Bring someone to those appointments. If you don't have a spouse or you don't have a family member, find someone in your community. Is there a neighbor? I've seen a couple patients lately that their neighbors have stepped up. Yes, sir. That was the best, most important decision I made was yes. to tell the nurses and the doctors that this is my advocate. There you go. And they need to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. And if that person is the contact person, then all calls should go to that person. I have, a, I have many patients who say, you know, their, their son or daughter will say, call me. I'm arranging all the scheduling to make sure they have drivers to get to these appointments. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of folks from, from my hometown who the ladies will call her and they'll set up, well, go in for a treatment. And then most importantly, we'll go for coffee afterwards. So, can I take you to coffee? Oh yeah, and can I take you to your treatment too? You know, so <laughs> it's kind of a nice uh, support time. Know the questions you want answers to. Now this is a hard one because what questions are there to ask? How do you know what questions to ask? Um, and if you don't know, there is a great website, <clears throat> cancer.net. In the binder I give out to patients, I have this whole list of questions in there. And it's all by, by um, specialty. So questions to ask my surgical oncologist before my surgery. Questions to ask my medical oncologist. And questions to ask my radiation oncologist. Now granted, there are very, they're, they're very general but also specific questions. And most of the time, the doctor will go through his, his or her spiel. And they'll answer a lot of these. But when you're going through these appointments, Make your notes and then see which ones were not answered. And is it because it wasn't asked or did they go through that and you don't remember or you didn't get it answered well enough, you're confused? Also, on the back pages, there's a additional questions. Write your questions down that come up. And, or if you bring in a legal pad, make spaces between your questions so that you have room to write it in. So many times you write one and the next line underneath you write another one while it's hard to keep your answers connected to that question. I do have about 10 copies of these if anybody wants any of these. And I brought my business card too, so if somebody didn't get one and they want me to fax them or email, just send me an email. I've got my email address on my business card. So those are the examples of the, the documents there. But when you have knowledge, when you know your story, when you have knowledge about what's going on, one, you lessens your fear, right? Because you know more about what's going on. And two, that's when the informed decision making comes in. Because you know everything, you've got everything you answered, and you can then make a decision regarding your next steps. <clears throat> so know your needs. Um, we talked about finances already, right? This is incredibly expensive. And um, we got to figure out how can we make treatment affordable to patients. We're working on that, obviously, with foundation, um, uh, with foundations such as this one to draw that attention and awareness. We also have a financial advocate in the cancer center who meets with patients and does a benefits analysis um, if people need that or connects them with the, um, uh, our, our patient financial assistance package. Emotional support. We talked about the importance of finding a navigator, or excuse me, a, an advocate. 
Are there physical needs? Are you going to need support physically to get around and to treatment? We can have the best treatments in the world, but if you can't get to them, what's the point? Spiritual needs. That's incredibly important as well. This is a glimpse into your own mortality at this diagnosis. You question God. You question your higher power. You question your spiritual being, the reason for being here. And support for the loved ones. I love this picture. Uh, this older gentleman looking at this baby. Are you a sandwich generation person that's trying to care for everybody? So a couple of things real quick about what you can control. You can control how you react to the situation. You can control your own voice. You can ask for help. You can tell the nurses when you're having symptoms. We can't do, and I tell this to patients all the time, we can't do anything to help you if you don't tell us what's going on. And diet and exercise. We know that breast cancer patients reduce their risk of recurrence if you lose weight or you don't gain weight. So get out there and exercise and eat right. Know your next steps. After you leave that doctor's office, doctor, what do I need to do Okay, I need to have a scan. When do I come back to hear about that? And trust your decisions. You're going to be making a lot of difficult decisions. Have peace in your heart. If that's the right decision, you'll know it. You'll feel it and trust that. So that's the end of my talk. But thank you very much. So, Kim, thank you. Now, I would like you to take a seat over there. I would like to invite Mary Boisel, chaplain at United General Hospital, to take a seat here. <clears throat> so, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask questions to Kim and Mary. But my first question to Kim is, so can you educate if the patient's family member may go through anxiety and depression, what would you do? How do you help those patients as a nurse navigator? The, I mean, patient's family members, how do you help them? Um, well, one, I think it's important to identify that and, and talk further as to maybe why. Can they identify why they're um, having anxiety and depression? Is it from a past experience? Is there um, a past issue that this brings up for them? But also, in, in Bellingham here, we actually have social services. We have a social worker, and we have a nurse who functions like a social worker. And I will tie her in with that, that patient, with that resource. Because I deal with the more clinical aspect of what's going on with the patient, not to say that I can't sit down and, and kind of address some psychosocial stuff. But I think it's also key, as far as the navigator role, to get them in touch with the specialist that can address those needs. And they're trained therapists that can delve into that anxiety and that depression a bit more. They also have an, an entire spread lit, uh, sheet of lists of all providers in the community based on their experience with cancer or not and their insurance. And if the patient needs to go on or the family member needs to go on for individual counseling, maybe drugs and so forth, different antidepressants, and they can get them moved in with that resource. So, thank you. Um, Mary is a chaplain. So does anybody know what chaplain in hospital means? What training they go through? Mary, can you educate uh, what training you have to go through? Sure, let's see. Is this on? Uh, here we go. Is this on yet? No? Yes. Okay. So people have a lot of different ideas of what a chaplain does and um, how, we, how we become a chaplain. Uh, well, to answer your question directly, um, I'll just put it bluntly, it took nine years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to get a BA and then a four-year MD of it. And then 2,000 hours of clinical pastoral education, much of which I did through um, Peace Health St. Joe's. And so, but it doesn't matter how much education one has, if we can't, I mean, it's helpful, of course, but if we can't meet a person exactly where they're at and maybe delve into, as you were saying, Kim, what's the trigger for your anxiety? Are you feeling deeply alone? Are you facing mortality for the first time? Are you just overwhelmed about what this is going to mean for your family members and you don't want to be a burden? So 
for all those nine years of education, the most important thing I do is, is listen deeply and respectfully. And then help people get in touch with their own sources of healing and hope and finding ways to make meaning in the midst of something. Wonderful. So chaplains are highly trained people. And they are not necessarily somebody who, who used to be a priest in, in temple or church or somewhere. So they are well trained to understand patients and their family members' spiritual beliefs and help them with the whole process. Um, so Mary, have you seen patients uh, who have family members who had anxiety, tremendous amount of anxiety or depression? Uh, and what you did? So anxiety and depression are extremely common um, in a cancer diagnosis. But I will say from my own experience as a, a breast cancer survivor, one of the questions I ask after we get to know each other a little bit is not only what resources or what um, support systems you have, but what might be some of the gifts along this path that you never asked to be on? It's a way of looking at entering this experience and embracing it as a potentially transforming it. It was transformative for me because I hadn't really, I faced mortality before, but to make peace with the fact that I died and how, as the Dalai Lama would say, how do we actually live before we die? I mean, everybody dies, but not actually, not everybody truly lives. So what matters to you, and how can that begin to shape your life and your care decisions? Now, if you have questions, please raise your hands. So. It's more of a, a kind of a comment along the way of what you just said about the mind and spirit. Uh, a week ago, Friday, I met a man who is living with cancer and he is paralyzed from the waist down, but he has to have a symbiosis with the cancer that is there and he has to keep it alive to keep becoming, from becoming a paraplegic. And I thought that my case was severe and I had it, you know, and I thought of him and how his life is, knowing that he has to keep that cancer in his spine active or he will not be able to move i thought what an incredible story and what an incredible man and uh, i shook his hand with a tear in my eye because i was greatly touched by that i'd never in my struggle with this disease never looked at it from a point of view like that and I, it was quite profound but um it's not really a question <laughs> Right. Um, I have a question about teamwork and using each other's resources. We all live in the same area, and I know this is about that kind of thing, coming together as a team and working together as a team and pooling our resources for all the patients in our areas. Is that something that is feasible to do, smaller hospitals not being able to have some of the resources that the bigger hospitals do? Can our patients come there? and be a part of that? Is that something that's possible? Is that more specifically about like the support services and so forth? Well, the, we don't, um, we're still growing and mm -hmm. our hope is to have some of these bigger programs. We started, like Dr. Shaw said, a musical program from United um, mm -hmm. Peace Health and I was wondering if I can give my patients information for the yoga things mm -hmm. and the Reiki things and all those wonderful things that I think massages, things that keep them de-stressed while they're going through all of this. Right. Is that something that's possible? Um, it can be talked about. I mean, right right now, those services are provided in this community for the patients of this community because our resources are also limited to reach the number of patients in this community. Um, so over, I think it's over 2,000 or so patients in Whatcom County are diagnosed a year. I think it's something like that. I have to look back. Um, and 
patients that go elsewhere for treatment but are still from this community do are able to access those. <clears throat> our problem is our um, our therapy class is booked solid. Um, our yoga class is incredibly active. Um, so what I encourage people do is go to the local gyms, go to the whatever gym in Mount Vernon is around. I guarantee you'll find a provider in that community somewhere who would be willing to donate an hour a week to provide those services where you're at. Um, find a music instructor in that community, even if they sit around, folks sit around and, and drum to a very soothing music. Um, it can be done. I think it just takes the legwork to go do it. Um, and we, you know, our outreach coordinator would be happy to talk about how to set those up. Uh, we also have to be mindful of the numbers. And, and two, coming up from that area, it is a half an hour drive, and sometimes that's prohibitive. Um, so we're open to, to partnering, absolutely. We've already done a lot of that, but um, some of the classes, it's, it's tough. Yeah, so those things are feasible, Mary. Um, you must realize that patients who have cancer and who are going through chemotherapy, they may not be able to travel here two days a week for yoga. So it needs to be looked at in a bigger perspective. So myself and the administrators at United General Hospitals will be talking about all those things to see how we can make these things more available locally. Now, we don't have to own everything with partners, and that's how we can provide more services to our patients. And yes, to in, in short, answer to your question is yes, we can do that, and that is feasible. Any other questions? Yes. Again, what is your question again, if so everybody can hear? Her name is Tracy Pantuzo, and um, she's local here in Bellingham. But we work with her um, at, uh, at, she comes weekly to our tumor boards as well. And it's just a matter of giving patients her name and contact information. And that's how we work with her. And then she sees them and writes notes back to us. And it's just, a, it's, it's the idea that a mutual support and saying, yes, please go see her. And she'll say, yes, please come back and tell that doctor what your problem is or what your concerns are. So it's, it's a mutual communication. Any other questions? Actually, it's not a question, it's sharing information. The local WISE have started a program called Live Strong and it is available and along with that goes a free membership to the Y. So I would encourage people if they're looking for resources for physical exercise, especially for cancer survivors, to check out the local Y because it's a, a newer program for them but they're doing it I think in, I know they're doing it in Bellingham and all of the Whatcom County Y's. They're probably doing it in Skagit as well. Thank you. Actually, it's, it's called Live Strong. Yeah. If you actually, have questions about that, I can answer them. Okay. Yeah, I just want to plug that because I've done that. Uh, before it was Live Strong, it was run, uh, it was set up by Fred Hutch. Yeah. yeah. And the Y, the, the, the woman that runs the program at the Y is highly trained. And I had had so many bad experiences with going to the gym post treatment because I'm an ovarian cancer survivor, I've got multiple surgeries, and I got the worst um, advice from trainers at gyms. Oh, just treat it like it was a, you know, you've had like a hippie, oh, you know, anybody that's had a baby that had to happen, you know? And it was like, I, and I ended up with nine hernias. Anyway, long story short, I took all of my, um, my reports, my surgical reports, in to the Y and said, read these, I don't want to hurt myself anymore. So I no longer go to the Y, but they got me started in exercising daily, and I'm very grateful. We've been connected with them for quite a few years now. They've, we've been funneling patients um, to that program. Um, it's maybe newly called Liz Trump. It's newly called Liz Trump because Fred Hutch set them free, and they went. They had to go. They're actually better trained than the Liz yeah. Trump people. Well, it's the it's um, the STAR program is what Fred Hutch had started, and that actually was a nationwide thing, and I think that just went under. Exercise and Thrive, it was called. That, yeah. yeah, but the start is 
certain type of instructors. But anyway, yeah, the Exercise and Thrive program actually has been going on here in Bellingham for quite a long time, but the gal who runs it at the Y is absolutely phenomenal. We've had her actually involved in some community programs we've talked about and done some trial exercises with patients, so it's wonderful. Yeah. Can, can I add something that you guys talked about? The, the, um, I think it's really important in a small community for there to be an inclusivity. And what you said that if you were local but you had your cancer treatment elsewhere, you were welcome at the cancer center, that's not true. I, all the time, it's not. I'm an ovarian cancer survivor. If I had stayed locally, I would, obvious, I would, it's, uh, my survival chances were extremely poor. So I did go to SCCA for all my treatment, but I was barred from many of the of auxiliary treatments at the cancer center, even though my primary care physician wanted me to go to them. So I couldn't get massage, I couldn't get acupuncture. I was allowed to go to the yoga class. Um, some, I mean, it, it, was, it was very selective and I understand that numbers are an issue, but it wasn't my fault that, that Peace Health didn't have a gynecological oncologist. Right, right. Um, so, and I so what I'm saying is that I, 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 yes, they sort of do, but not exactly, because I really did need and want the massage. But, uh, <coughs> yeah, not do everything. I know. I know. So, I was, yeah. first of all, thank you for bringing those things up. So it also tells us how critical it is for us to find the right people. So trained people. So not every massage therapist is good at you know, giving massage to patients who have cancer, who are going through treatments. So you must find the right people. Secondly, cancer treatment is highly complex. Highly, highly complex. So I have sent patients to Maryland, Bethesda, for clinical trials. You see what I'm saying? So we do here, we provide everything we can. Having said that, there are services that are provided in Seattle better. And for the best outcome for patients and family members, we need to collaborate. Collaboration is the you know, only answer. We can't say, oh, we have a cancer center, we have to do everything here. But that is not going to happen. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. We have a question? interested and willing to help and go through that educational process for oncology, oncology massage, on oncology training. Um, so I'm wondering, you have mentioned before that you have helped other people get trained for certain, for certain things. Is there any way to help the community find, um, just find training for that? As an oncology massage therapist, I've been trained for oncology massage. I've looked, um, I've talked to other therapists who actually volunteer, and they have no training whatsoever. And it kind of, it scares me. Because <laughs> I know, I know what can happen. I can know about flooding the system. I know about the lymphatic system. I know um, as a decongestive therapist in training that there's a lot that you need to know as a therapist, as a, as a physical trainer. And um, I'm wondering, how can, we, how can we get other therapists trained? So the training I talked about is primarily foundations uh, in Divers internationally. So we have brought international doctors and nurses here and have them go back to their country and set up different programs such as hospice program and bone marrow transplant programs and all that. So locally here, <clears throat> I guess uh, this is a very important question. One thing to do would be bring this up with uh, uh, the leadership at Cancer Center here so they can see how you know, the collaboration can happen in a more effective manner, in a more productive manner. So more discussion would be, uh, you know, discussion with the leadership would be more uh, beneficial. So, which No, the, the who is the individual she should be contacting? Um, we're in this. Um, our executive medical director left in December, so we're in the process of filling a little bit of an administrative void. So if you can hang on for a little bit, 
But what I would also encourage you to do is start connecting with other providers such as yourself in the community and start having that discussion. Um, like I mentioned, Tracy's name. Tracy is integrated already into our cancer center and she has gone out to other providers um, to have treatment by them to, to find out are they, for herself, I mean, we all do it, right? You go to this provider, find out are they, are they good? You know, and getting a sense of their, their abilities. And putting some sort of symposium on yourself that maybe at the, gosh, even at a farmer's market, you know, posting a table and say we're in a, a, an oncology focused, hands on uh, naturopathic treatment modality. Um, and I think I could see that growing more locally within the cancer center. So hang on though for a little bit while we're in the process of hiring the executive director and then so forth. But I, I like it. Sure. And also connect with Bridie. Yes. Email Bridie and we'll see how we can help you through the process. United General Hospital is in Cedar Uli and we serve patients in Cedar Uli, um, Burlington, Mount Vernon, Stanwood and neighboring areas. So you can always connect with us if you want to expand in that area. So Tina, can you raise your hand? So 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 Tina is the nurse navigator. She's she's a star nurse navigator. She she's actually amazing and fabulous. So she she will be able to help you. And by the way, Tina will be speaking at our next summit in Cedar, in, in Mount Vernon. When is that? It is on March twenty sixth. So March 26th, we have a similar kind of uh, summit, but we'll talk about different topics, including immunotherapy, nurse navigation, radiation therapy. We have Dr. Bill Hall who will be there, who will talk about radiation therapy. We will have <clears throat> a different Sketch Valley reporter to talk about the resources, because it is so critical that I wanted this thing to be discussed among us, all of us. So we know what is the right source of info. So yeah. So if uh, I also want you to let others know who may be, uh, who may benefit from this this kind of symposium in future, and we will be organizing similar summit here in June. And the focus would be very different than what we have done here right now. So we are yet to um, uh, uh, finalize the, the final agenda, but we'll have alternative therapy the complementary therapy. We will have a whole panel session. We will have massage therapist and different people. So we'll talk about those things to see what works, what does not work, what is the misconception in the community and all that. Any other questions you have? Yes? When I, when I retired from the Seattle area, I moved up here and I'm in healthcare. Uh, at that time there was a pamphlet, probably 20 pages of all the resources that community and that kind of faded away because there's no one that kept up with it or anything else and I'm wondering if there's been any thought of a, a grant to come up with an email type online thing because what happens we have to go to different conferences to find out what resources are in the community and most of us don't have that time to keep going to conferences to try and figure out what's available so that is something we can bring this up at the cancer uh, cancer center but at the same time I would ask you to connect with Kim in, uh, in Bellingham and Tina in Sidrauli for all those resources because they are fantastic resources. And I can't emphasize enough how important nurse navigators are. Like my job becomes so much easier just because of them. And they do all the legwork and I get the credit, which is unfair. <laughs> so. Any other questions? All right, so I just want to thank all of you. I hope you found it educational. So the whole, this is not a one-time meet. We are going to have regular meetings like this, and we'll talk about different aspects of cancer care, different aspects of healthcare. We'll talk about how we as American individuals, the citizens, and we as society, how we can make things better. And this is going to be a forum where you will hear information right from horse's mouth. So you are not really uh, looking at Dr. Google. All right, so, because I think we need to get better at it. Knowledge is power, and we must empower ourselves. 
So please give us a feedback and thank you so much.